Welcome to this Rabo Research Food and Agri Conversation. Today our conversation is economic unravelling and weaving new cloth from old. My name is Cheryl Kalish-Gordon, Senior Commodities Analyst with Rabo Research based in Orange, New South Wales. So for many of you, you'll be aware that the Cotton uh, Collective for, that was meant to be held in August, uh, late August in Toowoomba was a COVID casualty. At the Cotton Collective, uh, my colleague, global strategist Michael Every, was to join and provide his worldview on what's happening and what this means for the Australian cotton industry. We couldn't go ahead with the Cotton Collective, but we didn't want that to get in the way of our cotton clients getting the messages from Michael. So here to join us today for a, a discussion is Michael Every. Welcome, Michael. Thank you very much. Good to be here, albeit virtually, um, and very much looking forward to discussing what I was hoping to discuss in person. Now, we have touted this as a fireside chat, so we want to keep it quite quite chatty today and, and a bit more of an interview than a presentation. But uh, I'm guessing, based in Singapore, there's no fires happening there. No, it's red hot already. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm based in Orange, New South Wales, so uh, it's warming up here and no fires here either. But uh, still, we're going to have a chat and um, learn about what's happening globally with uh, cotton, uh, well, the, the global economy and what that means for cotton. I guess as we start out and and as we're here in August, uh, September and August of uh, 2021, we're in a situation where the cotton outlook's pretty good. I mean, we've had a a really big increase year on year for the harvest that's just finished. And that's great news after the drought that we had. Um, Prices in August hit a uh, multi-year high at $661 um, a bale. And um, the outlook is also good for pricing. So putting that together with a really great season ahead um, as as we start the season and planting's just around the corner, um, we've got uh, good irrigation um, availability. We've got good incoming moisture. The rainfall, out for our uh, forecast looks great. It's all lining up really nicely. But... I understand we need to be a bit more circumspect when it gets to the global picture. And that's where I want to get to you today and this unravelling you speak of. What do you mean by this situation of unravelling of the economic systems globally? Well, first of all, let me just start by saying this is normally where I come in at any conference like this, which is everyone says everything's going great and the industry is looking gangbusters, which is usually true in Australia. And then I come in and rain on everyone's parade. Uh, And unfortunately, I'm I'm going to do the same again here, metaphorically, because when we talk about the unravelling, there are so many aspects of that that we can see playing out around us. And I'm sure that viewers will be aware of some of them just watching the news. But if we start with the economy, let's just think of the basic rules of how you think the economy works, or at least within the Australian experience. Can the government spend money freely again? Does government debt still matter? Yeah, it used to. We had to balance that budget. We certainly don't anymore. What about inflation, which is going up and up? Are we worried about that or aren't we? We're not quite sure. Are we still pro-trade, given what's going on internationally? I mean, Australia is in terms of exporting. How about in terms of importing? How about, very controversially, even immigration? Because we've had the RBA coming out and saying the more immigration you have, the lower wage growth tends to be, which is something I've actually been arguing for years. We've got people asking questions about whether the government should play more of a strategic role in the economy rather than laissez-faire. And that's just the economy. I mean, I can keep going. If we talk about central banking, what do central banks do now? What's the RBA doing? Now we've got basically zero interest rates and we have QE or quantitative easing. What does a central bank look at? Is it inflation? Is it jobs? Is it house prices? Is it social justice? Is it carbon? None of these questions are clear, not just in Australia, but anywhere. In society, more broadly, I think we can see that we have polarisation. We have populism. We've got faith in the media and in science, even in democracy, all falling in country after country. We've got draconian lockdowns, which are now, of course, part of normal life and even heavy censorship of, so- heavy censorship of social media being proposed, and even in Australia. Uh, and, you know, it's not just Australia that these, uh, these things apply to. It's, it's a global problem. We've got environmental issues, which we're all deeply aware of and which are extremely pressing. Uh, We're not quite sure how we're going to solve those environmental problems, uh, how we're going to square the circle between growth and the environment. And then, to round off, we've got questions over the world order. Now, I was already going to talk about that before the events in Afghanistan transpired, and I think that only underlines the kind of points that I was going to make about how things can change much faster than you think 
and they can reshape how you think the world looks. And that comes back to all of us, every country, every industry. So that's a really big introduction there, Michael. Lots to cover there in this conversation going forward. And I guess I firstly want to get a handle about around, you know, this is a trend that you've seen coming for some time. Has COVID increased the speed at which we've seen this changing situation globally? And does it underscore, and am I really pulling out from that, that governments are finding it harder to assist guide the future of their economies into the future because those levers are more difficult to to manage now. Absolutely right. I mean, pre-COVID, if we're talking globally, not just in Australia, we were already on a very, very sticky wicket. We had been since the GFC, the global financial crisis, uh, back in 2008, 2009. And in fact, you could argue we were before the global financial crisis and the crisis showed that we were on a sticky wicket. Well, since then, effectively, we've just been drifting sideways. Every year is going to be the recovery. Every year, wages are going to go up. Every year, the economy will go back to normal. It never has. Then we've been walloped by COVID. And what we've seen happen during COVID is instead of a V-shaped recovery, which is what everyone expected to see, we've seen a K-shaped recovery, where some people are on the up leg of the K. They've never had it better. And other people are absolutely doing it hard and will continue to do it hard. I mean, if you've got a job in tourism... In some countries, you're absolutely you know, out on the streets begging for food. Thailand, for example, not too far away from Australia, generally a fairly prosperous place. It's been absolutely wiped out by the lack of tourists, including Aussie tourists. That's not going to be coming back anytime soon. And yet in other places, tourism's absolutely going gangbusters because no one's got anywhere else to go. So it's a very, very mixed picture. What do governments do against that kind of backdrop? How do you help the losers when the winners are doing oh so well? Do you raise interest rates? Or do you push interest rates down even further? Do you spend more money? And if so, how? How do you cover the debt? That brings you back to the points I was just raising, which is we don't know quite what to do. Now the rules of the game have changed so dramatically. And is this applying to all nations equally in terms of not knowing what to do? It seems that some of our um, trading partners have an idea of what to do and some of our big <laughs> trading partners have got fairly firm ideas of how they're going to play in this future going forward. Well thank you for raising that point because that absolutely links back to an issue that obviously I was going to talk about anyway uh, in Toowoomba and is now even more pressing in light of recent developments which don't come as a complete surprise to me against that particular backdrop. Yes you've, if you're alluding to what's happening in China you are absolutely right they have made it very very clear that they also see the same problems of income inequality, of some parts of the country doing very well and others being left behind, of some people day trading stocks and making a fortune and other people slaving away and earning very little every month, and that this is not a sustainable way to proceed. Now, their answer, of course, for what is a Marxist economy, and I don't want to shock people, but it is openly a Marxist economy. It declares itself to be, it acts like that, and it is currently implementing that kind of policy is to say, right, we need to go back to basics. You see many commentators, and I'm not using my own words here, I'm using theirs, talking about a new or a neo-cultural revolution happening in China, which is going to reshape the economy, reshape business, reshape how we see that country going forward. Now, there are upsides to that and downsides. Nothing is black and white or red or white, if you will, Um, but it makes it a much more complicated picture. Uh, And it certainly doesn't suggest we can just go back to how things were a few years ago. Well, and and one of the things about how things were a few years ago is that we had a pretty chummy relationship with China. We were signing a free free trade agreement in 2014, 15, that period. Um, They were on the growth path. We were expanding exports to China and capitalising on their growth. Um, A lot of nice headlines and uh, good friendship between our, our nations. Not so much now, and that's really pertinent for uh, cotton exporters given uh, the high reliance we've had on that market uh, up until the last year or so. I completely agree. Um, People who have heard me speak before will probably be aware that I've been banging this drum for many years, saying that for a variety of reasons, from, from the economic structure to geopolitics to the internal dynamic within China, which, as, as I stress again, is unashamedly a, a Marxist economy, although there are spectrums of what that means. That doesn't mean they're closing down all market forces completely. 
It's just that market forces have to be subsidiary to the demands of the state rather than saying laissez-faire. But for all those reasons, I always argued that eventually push would come to shove and Australia would realise, actually, we're probably in a bit too deep here, or we are in too deep, and we need to be pivoting and looking elsewhere and doing, el doing other things. And, of course, that's come as a tremendous shock to people who never read Karl Marx, presume that every country in the world is the same as they, are, as they are, despite the fact they have different flags and different political systems, that markets are markets, right? They're not. They absolutely aren't. And that comes as a short, sharp shock for people who realise it. All right, so we're, we're now in 2021 with a fairly toxic relationship with our, one of our biggest uh, trading partners. And is there anything we can do to turn that around? Given everything you've said about what's happening globally in just terms of structures, but then our relationship particularly, I mean, we've been given some ultimatums, right? Can we turn this relationship around? Can we meet those ultimatums? You can turn the relationship around by meeting the ultimatums. Whether you would want to meet the ultimatums is a question for Australians to decide, not me. I'm a, I'm a POM here in Singapore. But I would put it to you that if you look at the full list, uh, and hopefully you know, people will have a chance to look at that list and really absorb it for a moment, I don't see how getting rid of the free press or changing your political stance on many issues, both internally and externally, and basically becoming not a protectorate, but a Finlandized economy, and by that I'm referring to how the Soviet Union used to be next door to Finland, and Finland was nominally completely independent and could do whatever it wanted, but because it was tiny and vulnerable and it lived right next door to the Soviet Union, it pretty much had to always check what the Soviet Union wanted before it made any decisions. So unless you want to go down that route little by little, step by step over time, then you can't meet those conditions. And if you can't meet those conditions, it would have to be China that pivots back towards Australia. And I don't see that happening at least in the near to medium term, maybe in the very long term, but even that's questionable. Well, if we go on track with the uh, seven years ago, we were great mates, seven years future, how, how might we look then? I, I don't think we can meet those either. So our outlook is that we don't, those power plates have moved globally and we have to uh, move along with that, I guess, but not pivot back to, or not, not, not maintain our relationship there with China in terms of exports. Well, let me put it like this. You're, you're correct. Seven years ago, all the headlines were chummy as you like. Right now, the headlines are, oh my goodness me, this is a new cultural revolution. What the hell's going on? Blah, blah, blah. If you maintain that momentum seven years from now, you don't want to imagine what the headlines are going to look like. It's, it's quite worrying. So the message that's important for businesses to grasp is if you're shocked contrasting the 2014 headlines with the 2021, put your thinking cap on just for a second. Imagine what 2028 is going to look like. And if you're still relying on the same trade patterns in 2021, you're relying on in 2014. Do you not think you're running a risk, even if it's a tail risk, of being caught very, very short by events that could transpire during that seven year window? Now, does that mean it's going to happen? No, history is not for written, even though you know Marxists think it is. But risk aversion needs to be there a little bit. You have to be aware that the tail risks here are really quite spectacular. And so that requires thinking, okay, in that case, what would we like the world of 2028 to look like if we can't have it looking like 2014? What's a suitable alternative that actually leaves Australia and Australian cotton in a good position? And so picking up on sort of the broader changes when you when you talk about um, the central banks and the like and economies thinking, oh, how do we rebuild in the in a way after the COVID pandemic? Is, is this an opportunity to change? I think we're seeing some of those strong signals about China and our relationship in that with the allies. But one of the other things that keeps on coming through is on the environmental front and um, what maybe the rest of the world outside of China and our other trading partner possibilities are thinking about sustainability. What are you seeing on that front and how does that play into how we might see the future um, with this world where we might be looking to move away from China? Well, sustainability obviously is a key buzzword. Everyone's using it at the moment. It's often seen as kind of like a sing kumbaya around the campfire, kind of hippie you know, nice green ideal that we're all going to get there and we're all in it together and it's, this is great, etc. Look, the bad news is sustainability and green 
are going to become absolutely political and geopolitical. And I don't just mean, say, for example, within Australia, whether you're for or against coal, just as an example, okay, which is obviously affecting the economy, jobs, political party stances. I'm talking on an international basis. Um, as we transition towards the green economy, the entire industrial supply chain that we currently have globally will be rewritten. If everyone's going to shift from dirty production to green production and green electricity, we need a whole new different set of minerals rather than coal and gas and oil. We need lithium. We need, well, if you're going to go nuclear, you need uranium. Um, you need cobalt if you're going to be going that particular route. So where these are located is one issue. The supply chains to get them somewhere else is another issue. And then who controls the supply chains and the global value chain within that new order is what's at stake. Right now, pretty much everything is made in China, some in Japan, some in Europe, not much left in the US, but it's not green. When we shift the green, every country from America to Europe, to the UK, to Japan, to China, they're all putting their flag in the ground and saying, we are gonna be the ones who build the really juicy, expensive, high-end elements of the supply chain. For example, we're gonna be building the cars and the car batteries. Fine, but if everyone's gonna be doing it, either we deglobalize which is not something people want to think about, but that's the implication. Or we're going to have big winners and losers. So, for example, if America can start making green cars with cobalt, if it can source cobalt and lithium and automate everything and make it in America, who's going to miss out? China. Their economy will be smashed by that. Or if China's going to do it, America can't decouple from China. They can have as much tension as they want. But if they want to meet their green targets, they'll have to buy everything from China. So effectively, what we're already seeing is the beginning of a more 19th century style world where everyone's looking for resources, which they don't have, trying to set up supply chains to make sure they get home and trying to use protectionism and tariffs and subsidies and build back better to say, yep, yeah, all those jobs are going to come home to us. And that involves a government that really understands how to think strategically, think in three dimensions, not just say, you know, you don't get, you don't get rich by trading with yourself, which is absolutely nonsense but every Aussie politician says it over and over again and actually has a vision for where you go from here in a fast changing world where there are a lot of sharp elbows and if you don't have them you're going to get elbowed. So the interesting point that I picked up out of what you just said Michael was that um, rather than the green future of say the US being sort of in a, a dichotomized world where the West might operate together and the China and its, its trading partners might operate together. You talked about the US needing to rely on China um, for the inputs there. But does that mean that then China then does play along with the whole global idea of the same uh, definition of sustainability? Well, that's a possibility. Um, if China will meet the same standards as the US, that is entirely possible. This is all up in the air in terms of how it will go. And certainly American big business, Wall Street, Silicon Valley, Hollywood, they would love to basically say, let's rewind to a few years ago, just like Australia. Let's put all this cultural revolution and everything aside and let's just keep doing business the same way we have. But it's a lot of constituencies within America, obviously not just the Pentagon, not just national conservatives, but you know, new industries that would like to rise up saying, no, no, this is our opportunity to basically reindustrialize America, bring jobs back to the hinterland, make America great again, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And why wouldn't they stick to their own green standard and say, whatever standard China's got, ours is slightly higher. Your cars aren't green enough. They've got to be out. Now, we had that in agri for years, right? We all know what the agri sector is like in terms of, no, your standards aren't quite right. Our local product is better than yours. Why will that not play out in green to ensure jobs and to ensure national security? I'm quite sure that it will. And I actually think the more interesting picture alongside what would then be a split between the US and China is within the Western camp, who gets what part of the value chain? Because right now, for example, Europe is higher up than America in the automobile value chain. Germany has all the really juicy parts. America basically assembles it uh, for relatively low cost labor in the south of the country. Maybe America will get the high parts of the value chain and Europe won't. And that arm wrestle is going to involve, you know, some serious muscles and it won't all be about European style trade negotiation. There'll be some really, you know, aircraft carriers on maps being moved around kind of politics to how that gets decided, I suspect. 
Wow. Well, that's 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 certainly um, a, a very um, exaggerated. Well, not exaggerated, but the idea of, of that happening is something that's probably very hard to digest. If we move maybe to that idea of the supply chains and the West having opportunities to operate in that green supply chain, Australia doesn't have any cotton manufacturing, but is that the sort of thing you're suggesting that could be part of the future if they have these different supply chain futures as a result of building back better in different ways, but also China having a a, a global shift in its power? Well, look, let me put it like this. Back in the 60s, which you know just seems a million years ago, but that was the last time we also had uh, the Cultural Revolution going on in China, so it's a bit of a flashback. You know, this, the textile industry was, I think, the second biggest employer in Australia. There was once upon a time when you had an Aussie, an Aussie textile industry. Then, of course, we had globalisation and all the jobs go. If, if there were to be a repeat, we have to think of sustainability being a broader envelope. It's not just about green, although it would be about the green energy going into it, but it will be about the broader social standards. Now, obviously, China, cotton, social standards, sustainability, that's a very hot topic. I won't drill down into it right now, but I think everyone listening is aware of what I'm talking about. If that trend continues, what's to stop Australia if you have green energy, which you have the minerals to produce, and you've got the sunshine in terms of solar power? If you were to do that and you were to automate, so effectively everything's being 3D printed as well as being printed uh, or, or woven, shall we say, so everything's as high tech as you like, You've got free money from the RBA. You've got a government looking to try and push up wages and create good value-added jobs for Australia and diversify the economy away from just being an exporter of raw materials to being higher up the value chain. Why would you not have someone saying, okay, given we've got free money and we've got an activist central bank, rather than subsidising the housing market, which seems to be the mantra in Australia, why aren't we subsidising the industry, which is what China does, and actually say, no, no, we want high-tech cotton industry and a textile industry back here again, even if it's for a high-end market. We're not going to be going fast fashion here. We're going to be going, you know, a real high-end brand name product with a quality cotton going into it. Why wouldn't you do that on an automated basis and then have the factories actually producing the capital goods as well? And then finding new trade patterns within the quad, shall we say, you know, Japan and India, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, I'm not saying it can happen. I'm not saying it will happen. I'm saying these are the kind of conversations that need to happen if you're going to look at 2028 with anything other than complete trepidation, rather than looking back over your shoulder at 2014 and saying, well, why can't we be like that? Well, you know, why can't I be 10 years younger? I'd love to be, but I can't. Well, if we're looking at um, vastly different scenarios for the future, but something possibly a bit different, a bit more tangible, how about the idea that we might be uh, trading in Chinese currency as part of this uh, future? That's something that's uh, probably not too far in the future. We don't have to talk about 2028 for that. Mm. What's that going to look like for any exporters that are looking to continue to, to supply into China? Well, here's a hypothetical for you, but it's really becoming an increasingly realistic hypothetical. Let's imagine you're an exporter to China. Uh, it can be cotton, you know, could be beef, could be anything down from Australia. You've got a great Chinese client who takes, say, 30, 40, 50% of your, of your output, maybe 90 in some industries. And they say to you one day, look, we love your product. It's great. We want to sign a new 10-year agreement with you. So you're guaranteed you can keep selling it to us at a premium price too. We're going to pay you in renminbi, not in US dollars from now on. And it's going to be in digital renminbi. So it won't be coming through your bank. You download this app on your phone and the currency will just show up on your phone. Now, the problem is that digital renminbi is not going to be exchangeable for Aussie dollars because it's not going to be through the banking system. It's going to be on your phone. It will effectively be the equivalent of a widget or you know, some kind of a cryptocurrency, if you will, but of Chinese origin. And it will be fantastic if you want to buy stuff in China. So you sell to them. You've got these tokens, which are effectively only exchangeable in the Chinese shop. And off you can go back to China and order over the internet and get everything sent back to you in Australia. So provided you're prepared to do that, Bob's your uncle. You've got your supply chain sorted out for as far as the eye can see. But the geopolitical ramifications of that are you're moving away from using the US dollar and more and more of your earnings are in a currency you can only use with China or with a very small subset of countries. Now, we're not there yet. We are heading closer and closer towards a point where that decision may have to be made. 
And I'm not even sure if actual individual exporters will be in a position to make it because it could well be that regulators will turn around and say, we're not going to allow that because we can see where that leads in five or 10 years and we don't like it. And were that to happen, then your contract dries up overnight. So hypothetical, but it's not unrealistic. Okay. So you can imagine, though, that some smaller countries that are may, maybe way more beholden on a Chinese future, and I'm talking about some perhaps smaller cotton producers globally that aren't as, as wealthy or in a position to diversify in the way that Australia might be, could absolutely become part of that sort of trading relationship with China. Uh, hypothetically, they could. I mean, there are still a lot of other problems China needs to solve. I'm not pretending it's press one button and it's done. There are a lot of technical issues that I won't go into. But if you're talking about small countries that are vulnerable, that are specialised in cotton, that don't have a lot of other people to sell to, yeah, that's exactly who you'd look to. So then within the cotton industry, the interesting thing is then instead of getting together at conferences and you're all on the same playing field, you're effectively in two different camps. You, you really have that polarisation that we've you know, been worried about within this Cold War environment for a while. And then from Australia's perspective, you have to start thinking, how do we react to that? And again, I think the clever thing to do is not just say, you know, it's truth, we don't like this very much. It's to actually think, right, proactively, then what do we do within our camp? How do we absolutely cement our role within that? And that's got to be going up the value chain. That's got to be going up the price point. It's not going down. You can't compete as cheap as chips. You know, you've got to be something much, much more premium. But that involves a strategic view of what you're producing and who you're selling it to and how. Well, that, that, that sounds like it's a good point to, to get to in terms of what Australia needs to do. And, and you've mentioned a few different things there in terms of this polarisation, building back better in different ways, power moving to different parts of the world, you know, and resisting economic coercion is something that I, I think comes out of that. We need the government to be quite clear about standing our ground. Well, I believe you do. Um... One thing I just want to underline, economic coercion is as old as the hills. Australia loves free trade. You've embraced free trade for about, well, a couple of decades now. That's it. In your entire history as a country, you've had free trade for a couple of decades. Because when you were under the, the British, you didn't have free trade. You were economically coerced by the British. Maybe you didn't realise it, but you, know, you were part of a greater plan that the Brits put in place within, the, first of all, the empire, then the Commonwealth. Australia is now free to do whatever it wants. But that's a very narrow historical experience for Australia and for the rest of the world. There's going to be economic coercion from many different powers going forward in many different ways. Uh, and maybe Australia itself needs to do a bit of coercion, un unpleasant as it is. But you have to recognise, as I said, it's a very, very sharp elbowed world that we're in now. And just please, as a country, if not as an individual you know, producer, recognise that laissez-faire is absolutely just gone and you need Aussie fare rather than laissez-faire. You need to be thinking about Australia Inc. Well, I know that the government here has certainly been supportive of um, diversification of markets and we've seen that happening in, in cotton over the last uh, 12 months since we've actually been on an unofficial um, ban in China and volumes have seriously dropped. We've, we've seen the, the cotton still flowing in some, in some uh, months but uh, really down. Uh, that's got to be a critical part of this, this uh, diversification and, and also building more resilient supply chains. What's, what, what's your message on that and what do you mean by a bit more uh, resilient supply chains? Well, first of all, supply chains where you don't think there's going to be a change of government that blows the whole thing up. So therefore, you need governments who can see it's in their own long-run geostrategic interests to maintain that relationship. Because if you look at the EU, for example, which is now, you know, this closer and closer union with a common currency, that started off as the European stock, uh, coal and steel community uh, just after World War II, so that France could monitor how much coal and steel Germany was producing to make sure Germany didn't rearm on the sly to invade them again. You may not know it, that was the root of the European Union from monitoring that. But gradually everyone realised that their economic interests lay in that security interest and you end up with the EU. So from Australia's perspective, you have to look around you and think, okay, if we need to diversify away from China, who else is feeling the same way we are? Who else has got a similar set of interests to us? Maybe not in every dimension, but in enough that we can look for the 21st century, or at least the first half of it, and say, you know what? We need to be walking in the same direction. We, we are stronger together in this particular respect. Now, traditionally, of course, that's the Brits, that's America, but economically, is that gonna help out? Okay, to a degree, 
I think within the region, you need to be looking to other countries um, like India, like Japan, for example, um, like Vietnam and others, and being far more creative in terms of having real discussions about not just how can we maximize what do we sell to you, which is what happened under WTO negotiations. It's if we're going to be partners for the next 50 years, how do you get stronger and I get stronger to make sure that you don't suffer coercion, I don't suffer coercion, and together we can actually build a nexus which works for your whole society and my whole society. That's not how free trade deals are done, have, have been done up until now, but we need to go back to that kind of political horse trading. That's certainly a bit of a mind shift for a country where we, we do pride ourselves on being free traders and uh, you know, no subsidies compared to many um, global agricultural exporters. So um, a very, very big mind shift. Um, I think we're well on our way to thinking about diversification of markets, but note what you're saying about making sure that they work for us economically as well as in a ge uh, geopolitical friend uh, sense as well. Anything else to add in terms of how we move forward and make sure that in seven years, our farmers who grow great cotton, who want to continue to do that and want to get good prices for that, anything else to add? Well, it's as simple as this. Talk to other people in the industry, which is, is why it's great that we're having these kind of forums. Make sure you understand what's going on. Discuss it with your friends and your fellow uh, cotton growers. Get together and make sure that MPs understand what you're thinking as an industry and make sure that they see some of the arguments I'm putting forward here so that they understand it too, because maybe they don't, and gradually make sure that everyone's on the same page. Now, collectively, does that mean you're going to get the perfect result and in five minutes? No. But at least it gets you moving in the right direction. The last thing you want to be doing is not talking to anybody, sitting at home worrying or sitting at home looking fondly at the 2014 calendar and pictures of Tony Abbott and saying, let's go back to those days, please, because that's just simply not going to happen and it's not a way to plan for 2028. Important food for thought and for strategizing whilst we've got these this good year ahead of us um, in terms of pricing and production, at, well, at least as we are right now. Um, thanks so much for joining uh, me today, Michael, to, to dig into that, those underlying trends that are really going to shift global trade in coming years and help us prepare for what's happening into the future. My pleasure. And I hope to be down in Australia to discuss this with all of you in person at some point in the future. Yeah, fingers crossed that that uh, in-person uh, appearance, either on the Gold Coast or in Toowoomba, is not too far away. And thank you to everyone who has joined us for this conversation today. Looking forward to doing it again sometime. And if you have any questions, don't be afraid to get in touch with your rural manager or myself personally um, to further discuss any of the issues we've talked about today. Hope you have a great cotton season. Thank you.